Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to look at an introductory lesson to biochemistry. First things first, we need to look at the basics of biochemistry, and that is looking at the compounds that make up organic and inorganic substances. Firstly, let's look at organic substances. Organic substances are substances that contain the elements of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. And to be more specific, a substance is deemed as organic when the carbon molecule or element is attached to a hydrogen. Now, some examples of organic substances that you may be familiar with is something like DNA, table sugar, methane, and ethanol. And even though they may have other elements present within them, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, or sulfur, each one of these examples has a carbon backbone that has hydrogen attached to it, which makes it an organic substance. There are some exceptions to this where there are substances that do contain carbon, but it all comes down to the structure of the molecule and how that carbon attaches to a hydrogen. This then brings me to our inorganic substances. Inorganic substances such as table salt, carbon dioxide, diamonds, and silver all are examples of inorganic substances. And please note that carbon dioxide, even though it contains carbon even within its name, does not directly mean that it is organic. In this instance, it is not. So what are the defining qualities between these two groups? It all comes down to how do we put the elements together? There may be carbon present. However, it really comes down to in what order do we put those elements and how are they attached to one another? Let's look at the first and the most important inorganic compound that we need to know, which is water. And it's essential for life. And we could survive weeks without food, but unless we have water, we would die within a few days. Now, water has a very simple structure where it is made up of two hydrogen atoms that are attached to one oxygen atom. Now, water is a polar molecule, which means that one side is slightly negative charge, while the other side is slightly positively charged. And the molecules of water form hydrogen bonds with one another, and these intermolecular forces are responsible for the cohesion forces between the molecules. In other words, the bonds that form in between these water molecules is what holds them together. It's what, make, it's what makes them cohesive. Now, because water is polar in nature, which essentially means that it's slightly more negative on the one side of the molecule and slightly more positive on the other side of the molecule, it means that water has amazing adhesive properties. And these adhesive properties, if you want to think of them as being able to stick onto something, water adheres to lots of other substances very easily. And it does it in such a way that they form very strong bonds. And an easy way to tell the difference between adhesive and cohesive forces is that adhesive means, for example, when water adheres to something, it means to stick onto something. Think of how water adheres to a piece of glass and you watch the water droplets run down the glass. That's an example of adhesion. Cohesive is how water actually sticks itself together. And I'm sure you've noticed before how water, when it runs down a window pane or runs down glass, you'll see that the water droplets seem to run towards one another and pull each other into a much bigger droplet. And that's because of their cohesive forces. It is because water attracts itself and wants more water around itself. Water is also known as the universal solvent, and essentially what that means is, is that substances can dissolve easily into it. Think of how easily sugar or salt can easily dissolve into water. And so because it's so easy to dissolve substances into water, we often use it as the universal solvent or the universal substance in order to carry out experiments. But also within our own body, it makes it easy for substances to move through our body because of water being present within our blood and in and around our cells. Water is also really important because it's the main medium for chemical reactions in cells. And essentially, 
cells can go through different kinds of chemical reactions, one being something like hydrolysis, and that is when water is added to break down the bonds between molecules. And we do this and we use water to essentially cut open molecules so that we can get the necessary elements out of them. There are many other functions of water in the human body. For example, we need water to cool the body in terms of temperature, and that's linked to sweating. But we also need lubrication. We need protection. And so things like mucus and saliva are mostly made out of water. In plants, however, water is a very important component in maintaining turgor pressure. Turgor pressure is essentially the way in which plants stay upright, they don't wilt and bend over, and it's important that they maintain their water pressure. The second kind of inorganic compound we need to look at are minerals. And minerals essentially are dietary chemicals that we need to live. And there are two kinds. We get macronutrients and we get trace minerals or micronutrients. Now, perhaps as the name gives away, macronutrients are nutrients that you need in large amounts, whereas micronutrients or trace minerals are required in much smaller amounts. Now, plants can obtain their minerals from the soil, but animals need to obtain it through the food that they eat. And there is a large variety of nutrients that we as humans, but as well as other animals, need to be able to absorb. And in doing so, we need to take in these inorganic substances in order to maintain those levels within ourselves because we're unable to make any of these minerals. Now, these are just some examples that you can see on the screen now, such as calcium, magnesium, potassium, iron, and zinc. And essentially, you get these in different dietary sources. Calcium you can get in cheese, milk, green vegetables. Calcium is often associated with the development of bones. It's also really important for blood clotting, your nerve impulses, and in plants, it's an important component of their cell walls. The next vital mineral is magnesium, and magnesium can be found in fish, beans, as well as some green leafy vegetables and whole wheat products. Magnesium is important for the formation of bones and teeth, for muscles and nerves, and in plants, it's important for the chlorophyll molecule. Next on our important list is potassium, and potassium can be found in fruit, vegetables, and grains, and its function is the relaxing of muscles. We don't want it for the contraction, we actually want it for the relaxation of muscles. It's also there for your nervous system, and it's needed for enzymes in photosynthesis. Iron is often found in liver, meat, but it can also be found in beans, peas, potatoes, and green leafy vegetables. And it's a really important component as it's required for the synthesis of hemoglobin, which is needed for our red blood cells. It also forms a part of enzymes that make chlorophyll. And finally, zinc. Zinc can be found in dairy products, liver, and in wheat in particular. And it's a very important component of many of our enzymes. It's also extremely important in the brain development of a fetus. Now, if you don't get enough of these minerals, there are many different deficiencies or diseases that you can acquire through your lifetime if you don't get enough of these macro and micronutrients. They can range from things like rickets, osteoporosis, muscle spasms, abnormal functioning of the muscles in the nervous system, anemia, irregular heartbeat, goiter, and cognitive difficulties. Moving on to organic compounds, we're going to look at one of the most commonly known, which is a carbohydrate. Now, carbo means carbon, and hydrate refers to water, which contains the elements hydrogen and oxygen. And most of our sources of carbohydrates come from things like sugar, rice, porridge, potatoes, pasta, honey, fruit, and milk. 
Now, if you have a look at the diagram here, you will notice that the building blocks of carbohydrates are called monosaccharides. Mono means and refers to one. Saccharides are referring to these ring-like structures that you can see in front of you. Now, here we have three examples of monosaccharides. We have glucose, fructose and galactose. Each one of these comes from varying sources. For example, glucose can come from a starchy substance, something like a grain. Fructose can come from fruit and galactose may be coming from a dairy product. It's important to know that carbohydrates and the sugars associated with them are not necessarily sweet in taste. We mustn't always assume that carbohydrate equals a sweet tasting sugar. Now, monosaccharides are the building blocks of our carbohydrates. It's what we call our monomers. These are therefore the simplest of sugars, and they're also the most easily accessible sugars when we need them to use for bodily functions. Now, remember at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that organic compounds contain carbon. And as you can see in the pictures here, these um, monosaccharide molecules all contain carbons, but it's a little bit unclear as to where the carbons actually are. And the carbons are situated at each one of these fixed points that we see in this pentose shape. But that's not the only thing that makes them a organic compound. I also mentioned that it all depends on how the hydrogen molecules are attached to those carbons, because essentially when it comes to chemistry, it is the order in which the elements are found which dictates its structure, and therefore the structure will equal the function of that compound. Now, if monosaccharides are the simplest or the monomers of our carbohydrates, we now need to look at what happens when you string many of these saccharides together and what they ultimately form. So now we have looked at monosaccharides, and in this diagram here, you can see that a monosaccharide is a single ring, and our example here is glucose. But you also then you get more complex compounds where you put many of those monosaccharides together, and if you put two of those monosaccharides together, you're going to form a disaccharide. The example here is sucrose, and disaccharide literally means two, and essentially what it is is you are going to take a combination of monosaccharides. So for example, sucrose is a combination of glucose and fructose. Now, if we were to take it one step further and we wanted to add many of those disaccharides or many of those monosaccharides together, we are going to create a polysaccharide chain. Poly meaning many. And in this example here, we have an example of amylose, which is a type of starch. And you can see that we have our ring structures here that are joined together that form our polysaccharide chain. An example of some polysaccharides that you may be familiar with are starch, cellulose, and glycogen. Now, carbohydrates have some very important functions, and essentially they run on the most basic principle of providing energy for the organism. So these particular uh, functions of um, Carbohydrates are things like an energy source, which was uh, what I mentioned earlier, the fact that glucose is the most readily available energy to any organism. But it also serves as a reserve energy source, and that's the stored carbohydrates, the stored sugars that we find in the muscles of animals as well as in plants. In plants, our carbohydrates provide structure. It's the thing that gives plants shape and structure considering they don't have any bones. And lastly, it provides dietary fiber. And this is uh, particularly important in animals and their digestive systems in order to allow the matter to move through their digestive system successfully. Now, we need to be able to test for the presence of starch. And it's actually a very, very simple test. Uh, what you will need is some kind of indicator, which in this instance here is we are going to use iodine. And iodine is an indicator that will go from a brown yellow color to a dark blue purple color in the presence of starch. And so if you were to drop a little bit of iodine on a potato or onto a piece of bread um, and there's starch present, then it is going to turn a blue-black color. Whereas if you were to do the same on a piece of 
um, fruit or vegetable, depending on whether or not there's any starch in there, which there shouldn't be in any of your, for example, meat uh, or in your um, fruit, it won't change any color. It will remain brown yellow. And you should be able to carry out this very simple experiment in class. Now, we need to be able to take it one step further, and we need to be able to test for a more large variety of sugars because starch is a complex sugar, and it's just one of the many sugars that can be found. Another sugar that we should be able to be able to test for is reducing sugars, and reducing sugars refer to anything like fructose, glucose, sucrose, galactose, and essentially we need to be able to test for its presence. And it's a very simple setup, and the indicator that you need is called a Benedict's solution. Benedict's solution comes in a fairly vivid blue color. It's bright. And essentially, uh, once you follow the procedure of heating it correctly, adding it to your sugar, if there is any of your reducing sugars present, it will change a shade of color. And that color will determine how much of that sugar is present. So it's a very simple method. Essentially, what you're going to do is you're going to have a test tube with an unknown substance in it. You don't know if it has any reducing sugars in it. You're going to add your Benedict's solution with a dropper. You'll need a few drops. And then you're going to place your test sample in a water bath. Uh, the water bath allows for even heating. And you're going to boil the mixture for around five minutes. And you are going to observe the color possible change that could happen. So what is the expected result and what can the Benedict solution look like. So if you complete a successful experiment, you would receive one of the following outcomes. Now, it's a range of colors moving from the blue Benedict solution at 0% and moving all the way through to more than 4%. And so as you can see, it goes from a light blue Benedict solution, becomes more green, and then into the yellows, oranges, reds, and then finally brown. And what that means is the darker the shade as we move through the color changes, the more intensity and the higher percentage of reducing sugar is present in the test tube. A nice, easy way to make sure that you can actually see the color very carefully is if you do this experiment and you hold your test tube up to a blank white page, it just emphasizes the color a lot better and it allows you to compare your test tube. So you could even use a piece of paper resting within the test tube rack so that you can have the test tubes side by side and you can compare the colors from darkest to lightest. And so the next very important organic compound is proteins. And proteins are really the building blocks of life. It's what the majority of um, animal cells are made out of. And they are really, really important considering that they also make up enzymes. I'm going to do a separate video on enzymes because they need their own video, their own uh, a specific explanation. So I'm going to keep them separate from this. And we're just going to focus in on the structure of proteins and the function of proteins in this particular video. And what you're looking at here is a very basic um, structure of a protein where you have your amino group attached to your carboxyl acid group. And then you have this carbon in the center, which is almost like an anchoring point that allows you to exchange the different kinds of amino groups that sit on the edge here. And this R represents where you would attach another um, uh, uh, amino acid and so on and so forth. So you'd make like a long chain. Now, sources of protein obviously come from things like meat, milk, legumes, which is beans, grains, as well as eggs. And in order to take this chemical molecule and turn it into a living structure and being is quite a complex process. And so we're going to look at how do we take something like this and turn it into skin or saliva? Um, how do we turn this into muscle? So how do we get a cell membrane, a muscle? How do we get something like cytoplasm? How do we form those structures that contain proteins? How do we make hair? All of that is linked to how we put amino acids together. And amino acids are the building blocks of all of your proteins. In total, we have 20 amino acids that code for all the proteins found in every living organism on Earth. 
Now, these small subunits of proteins um, are not very usable as a single structure. They need to be put together in order for them to function. And when we attach many amino acids together via a peptide bond, you create what we would call a polypeptide chain. Polypeptide meaning many or 50 uh, amino acids attached together. Now, what's really important about these polypeptide chains that have formed is that the order in which the amino acids are put will determine what protein you make. And so even though on the surface, putting one or two small little building blocks together seems as though a small change would make no difference, often the order in which these amino acids are put together in their chain is extremely important as it dictates their function. Essentially, their structure equals their function. Now, once we have enough of these polypeptide chains, those polypeptide chains can fall in on themselves and they can become more globular. And essentially, they then form a protein. Now, proteins can take many different shapes. Um, they can be fibrous. Think of something like your muscles, which are fibers, and compare that perhaps to globular proteins. Something like your blood cells are more globular, the protein that makes them up. And so essentially, once you've made these long strings, and essentially it looks like a long string of beads, the way in which you fold them, twist them, will determine the ultimate shape of the protein. And when we put all those shapes together, we result in a much larger protein that has a very specific function. If you change the structure of a protein, you change its function. Now, this is a very important aspect of our proteins, is that their structure dictates their function. And in a separate video where I look at enzymes, which is a specific kind of protein, I will look at how things like temperature and pH affect the structure of enzymes and therefore affects how well they function. So now we need to test for protein. We need to see whether or not whatever substance that we have in front of us, it could be an unknown liquid or an unknown substance, does it contain protein? And like our previous tests, we need to use an indicator. And the indicator that we use for protein is burette's reagent. Burette reagent is used to determine whether or not proteins are present. And it contains sodium hydroxide and copper sulfate. And it is a light blue uh, in color. So that's the color it's going to start off. But what color does it become when you add it to foods that test positive for our proteins? And so if you look alongside here, we have our uh, burette's uh, reagent that we are adding to our unknown solution. And if you add it, it should turn a deep purple color. So a positive outcome uh, is a deeper purple whereas a negative is that burette reagent will remain a light blue. There may be varying shades of the purple, and so it's just important to have use a white page behind your test tube, and it sometimes allows you to see the depth of the purple that forms. It might be a lighter purple, a more lilac color, or maybe a very deep, deep royal purple. Our final organic compound that we are going to be looking at is lipids, which is also known as fats. And this is a group of chemicals that includes phospholipids, steroids, and triglycerides. Now, you may be familiar with what a phospholipid is. Um, it is a part of the cell membrane. It is a combination between phosphorus and fats. Steroids, on the other hand, are a collection of hormones uh, that are fat-based. And they are responsible for maintaining homeostasis within the body, as well as promoting growth and repair. And finally, we have triglycerides. Triglycerides are what we call true fats. It's usually things that you imagine to be such as fats, oils, things that you maybe would find in butter, margarine, cheese, salami, avocado, and peanut butter. Now, our triglyceride structure is alongside in the diagram, and it has two types of building blocks that make it up. It has a glycerol molecule, which almost so, sort of forms the backbone of the molecule itself, and it's an alcohol-based substance. Attached to that are our three fatty acids, which sort of branch off here in three arms, and this essentially is 
a long chain of carbon and hydrogen atoms with an organic acid group at the very end. And you can see why we call them triglycerides, because we have three fatty acids with one glycerol. Now, each time we actually form a triglyceride, when we take these three fatty acids and we join it to a single glycerol, water is formed. And we call this a condensation synthesis. Now, we know the basic components and building blocks of fat, but what exactly are the functions of fat? And there are actually numerous really important reasons to have fat in our diet. Our list of functions includes things like an energy reserve, and it is uh, very importantly an energy reserve, meaning that basically it's not our first source of energy. It's a reserve that we would use if we've used up all the carbohydrates in our body. The second thing is that it really is important to transport fat-soluble vitamins. These vitamins include vitamins A, D, E, and K. The third thing that we need fat for is insulation. We need to be able to maintain our body's temperature in order to maintain homeostasis. In other words, we need to keep the internal environment of our body stable. Next, it protects our organs, and often fat collects around very important vital organs. In particular, we find a lot of fat collecting around the abdomen as a way to protect um, our organs, in particular because there are no bones around them or perhaps there's very little muscle sitting around them. The second and almost final function of fat is cell membranes, and this is really important. Cell membranes are what holds our cells together. It gives them structure, um, it gives them defined shape, and ultimately it determines what goes in and out of the cell. And this is a really important function of fat because without a cell membrane, you won't be able to regulate what comes and goes in the cell. If you are unable to fix cell membranes with more fat, you also run the risk of cell death. And lastly, we have waterproofing. Waterproofing is more prevalent in plants, in particular their cuticles that they have on the outside of their leaves and stems. But in some animals as well, waterproofing would perhaps be there in the feathers of birds. Um, their glands secrete a waterproofing substance that makes sure that water just slides off their feathers. Now that we know the functions of fat, we do need to take a little bit more attention into the structures and their structural forms that they come in. Fats come in a saturated form or an unsaturated form, and we may be familiar with these terms in our daily lives in reading food labels, but what does it actually mean? Well, if we look at their similarities, you will notice running down the middle in both of these structures are a chain of carbon atoms, and they also have an outer uh, chain of hydrogens. But the main difference is how we actually bond these together. And you will notice in the unsaturated fats, the bonding is slightly different. And when you change the structure of something, you ultimately change its function and appearance. Unsaturated fats are fats that we are familiar with in terms of plant lipids or plant fats. And plant fats are things like oils, um, olive oil, canola oil, sunflower oil, um, margarine, and they are liquid at room temperature. Now, how to identify an unsaturated fat is to look out for these double bonds that appear. A double bond makes lipids melt very easily, and that's why we find unsaturated fats in a liquid form at room temperature. The second fat that you are familiar with is saturated fats, and saturated fats are our animal lipids. They are saturated with hydrogen, and that's essentially what it means to be saturated. And that means that there are no double bonds. So as you look down here, there is no double bonding between any of our carbon and hydrogen atoms. And these animal lipids can be found in cheese, butter, lard, um, whole milk. Um, and essentially, they're solid at room temperature. So if you think of the main differences between the two fats, it all has to do with their structure and um, unsaturated being more liquid-like and saturated being more solid. And of course, their origins, which is from plants and animals. Right, now how do we test for lipids? So a lipid test is actually a slightly more unusual one. There is no component or indicator that you're going to add to the lipid. 
Instead, lipids actually leave a greasy stain behind on filter paper. And so um, the only thing that you actually need to do is take a drop of the unknown liquid, drop it on some filter paper, allow it to dry, and depending on the stain left behind, if there is any, will determine whether or not there is any fat present. And so, for example, if you have a look on the screen, the water droplet is going to dry and it's going to disappear completely if you allow it enough time. However, an oil droplet on a piece of paper, which you might have noticed it happened before, if you've ever dropped food on a page, you'll see that if it sits there for a while, it leaves almost like a greasy stain that doesn't go away. It makes the page more translucent. And that is the test to see whether or not a substance contains any fats or lipids. Let's round off with a terminology recap. Remember, biology and terminology go hand in hand when we explain ourselves. So we looked at inorganic and organic molecules, and we looked at what makes them different, what makes a substance organic as opposed to inorganic substances. We looked at minerals, which were an example of inorganic substances, as well as we looked at water. And then we moved on to organic substances, and we looked at monomers, which are the building blocks of these organic substances. Each organic compound has its own monomer. And in saying that, we looked at carbohydrates. So carbohydrates have their monomers, which we call saccharides. Saccharides can be mono, di, or poly, depending on how many you have. We then moved on to proteins, and we looked at their monomers. And protein monomers are called amino acids. And amino acids are connected to one another to form a long chain, and we call those polypeptide chains. Take enough of those chains, group them together, and you will form a protein. We then moved on to lipids, also known as fats, and we focused in on particularly triglycerides, which are made out of glycerol and fatty acids, three fatty acids to every one glycerol, hence the name triglyceride, and we looked at its basic structure. We finally looked at if you take those structures, how do they influence the function and the resulting product? And we end up with saturated and unsaturated fats. Saturated fats are the fats we find in animal products. They are hard at room temperature, whereas unsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature, and we find those in plants. Once again, if you have liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, and I will see you again. Bye.